A group of us started the Prison Moratorium Project in California, having been inspired by a project with the same name here in New York State. And the reason we were inspired was because of one single panel that we had, uh, attended where the late Eddie Ellis said, what we should be doing is figuring out the entire sum of money resources that is going into prison, that if those resources were available to people doing social justice work, labor, organizing, and so forth, would make a huge difference in communities toward the goal of organizing people into a general strike. I said, that's a great idea. Let's get on it. So Prison Moratorium Project in California was uh, inspired by the notion not simply that we would stop them from building, building the next building, but rather that in the struggle to stop it, we could make common cause with uh, agricultural unions and environmental justice activists and people trying to restore funding for public education and people who never would have looked at each other, much less talked to each other. And we also thought someday we'll have a general strike. Unfortunately, that day never came. Doesn't mean it won't ever come. Um, similarly, in working with mothers and families, the idea was to see how mothers and families understood their vulnerability and the vulnerability of their loved ones, to understand what their um, inclinations were for organizing, and to see how they asked for certain kinds of help and that that combination of help and self-organization uh, flowered into really clear political consciousness. So it wasn't a matter of showing up and saying, no matter what these mothers say, I'm going to agree with them. Nor is it a matter of showing up and saying, no matter what they say, they have to listen to me and they have to agree with me. But it was really the encounter that created the conditions for this flowering of political consciousness, all of which was really fragile, but it really happened. Um, and thinking of those small organizations as something that is probably happening in many, many places around the country all the time um, gave me some hope that the really um, almost neighborhood-based work had the potential to scale up into something else. So in the California case, what scaled up was families to amend California's three strikes. It wasn't the most radical of organizations, but it did show what the possibility was for getting these really tiny, like six, seven, eight person at the core organizations to work together on something not only bigger than themselves, but also working on projects that in the short run were not necessarily going to benefit their individual loved ones. So people who fought for the various amendments to three strikes, the various um, reliefs uh, under a couple of the um, changes that have happened in recent years, didn't all see that their loved ones were going to benefit, and in some cases were never going to benefit. And that was, again, an example of this flowering political consciousness, which means a lot in this day and age where people imagine that what exists is the possibility of a winnable win and nothing else. Right. That, that kind of near-term tweaking Armageddon. It doesn't mean I haven't had criticism, you know, really significant criticism in how some of these reforms have been framed and who stands explicitly to lose from them. Right? So that is actually part of the fight as well, is to stand up and say, this is great except for it's not. Um, and then in terms of... Uh, US-based and international work, there is uh, all of the um, work that's been ongoing uh, concerning especially the deportation regime that we've been living under for the last eight years with uh, President Obama and the vulnerability of people not documented to be in the country, uh, which raises a contradiction. And the contradiction has been, as is the case in many, many, many struggles, that some insisting that there's a winnable win to be had, have tried to hive off the innocent not documented from the undeserving not documented. So that you know, creates a, both a possibility for international solidarity and a problem for thinking as abolitionists uh, about what is to be done. 
So those are some of the projects. And I guess one more that I'll, I'll talk about briefly. I mentioned environmental justice. And the reason that environmental justice has been so uh, powerfully meaningful in a lot of the struggles that I've been part of has to do with two related factors. One, the people who organize themselves into EJ orgs, um, organizations or groupings or movements, whatever you want to call them, have already come through a certain level of, let's call it political education, that many other people who get involved in anti-prison work don't come through. And so environmental justice brings to the anti-prison work in general a level of, I want to say political sophistication, and I don't mean academic sophistication. I mean political sophistication that a lot of anti-prison work requires and lacks. 